Hi, Black Cat Recapped here. Today I am going to explain a drama movie named Powder. At the hospital, a woman named N, who is going to have a baby, is brought in quickly because she got hit by lightning. This made her start giving birth earlier than expected. Many hours pass, and eventually, the doctor tells Anne's husband Greg that she passed away after giving birth. The doctor says that the baby is okay, but there might be some problems with him. They can already see that he has no pigmentation, which is the reason for albinism. Albinism is a genetic issue. Greg insists on seeing his son, so the doctor takes him to the room where the baby is kept in a special bed called an incubator. The doctor explains that the wires connecting the incubator to the machine next to it are used to measure the baby's brain activity. Greg starts crying, and when he looks at the baby, he refuses to accept that the baby is his own because of how the baby looks. The baby becomes more and more upset and starts crying too, as if it can feel the negative thoughts and emotions coming from Greg. While Greg is being led out of the room, the readings of the baby's brain waves become extremely intense. Almost twenty years later, Sheriff Barnum calls Jesse Caldwell, the director of the local youth shelter, to come to the farmhouse of an old man who recently passed away. He takes her inside the house and shows her a broken cup on the floor of the living room. He tells her that the old man died of a heart attack the night before and was found by the neighbors that morning. Before taking her downstairs, he explains that he called her because there is a boy hiding in the basement who refuses to come out. He didn't know who else to ask for help in talking to him. According to the neighbors, the boy is disfigured, and during the many years he has been there, none of them have had a good chance to see him properly. The sheriff starts to believe that the boy is actually the old man's grandson, and the old man kept him hidden in the basement to prevent him from being seen by others. They proceed cautiously and go down to the basement, where they discover the boy hiding in a dark corner. Jesse reaches out to the boy, and as he steps into the light, they are startled by his pale, hairless skin and purple eyes. They ask him his name, and he responds that his grandparents called him Powder, but his real name is Jeremy Reed. Sheriff Barnum goes to get Jesse and Jeremy some food. While she talks to Jeremy, she asks him why he didn't call the police or anyone when his grandfather collapsed. Jeremy explains that his granddad always warned him that if anyone saw him, they would try to take him away. Jeremy tells her that he has never been to school but has read all the books in the basement. Jesse takes out a book that she says is difficult even for most college students. Eventually, Jeremy and Jesse leave the basement together. As they step outside, all the police sirens and radios start going off and malfunctioning. While Jesse drives away with Jeremy, Sheriff Barnum notices something strange. There are about twelve lightning rods on the roof of the house. Officer Harley Duncan then expresses his unease about Jeremy. The doctors informed him that although the old man died of a heart attack, his heart showed signs of fibrillation, suggesting that he may have been electrocuted. When Jeremy gets out of the car, the other kids suddenly stop and stare at him. Inside, Jesse makes a phone call to the person in charge and arranges for Jeremy to take an IQ test. During lunchtime, Jeremy sits alone at a table. A group of teenagers decide to approach him and start bothering him. One of them, named John, begins insulting Jeremy because of how he looks. John says that on the first day at the shelter, new people have to wear a spoon. He tells his friend Mitch to show an example. Mitch balances a spoon on his nose while everyone else laughs at how silly he looks. Jeremy takes the spoon from John and then something strange happens. He starts controlling the spoon, making it stand on the table and attracting other spoons towards it, creating a tower of spoons. Everyone gets scared, but John gets angry and thinks Jeremy is some kind of abnormal person. When Barnum finishes his work for the day and returns home, he finds his son Stephen waiting at the front door. Barnum shows strong dislike towards his son by completely ignoring him. Barnum goes to check on his wife, who is very sick with cancer and cannot open her eyes or speak. The next morning, after the doctor confirms that Jeremy is perfectly healthy, Jesse asks him if he would like to go to school. Jeremy agrees to attend school. In science class, the teacher, Mr. Donald Ripley, is teaching the students about electric current. 
he turns off the lights and switches on a machine to show how electricity moves. While Mr. Ripley is talking, Jeremy starts feeling extremely uncomfortable. He tightly grabs onto his desk and begins to shake. The machine starts producing more and more sparks, getting stronger and stronger, until it releases a powerful bolt of electricity from one of its parts directly into Jeremy's chest. The electricity then travels through his body, passing through his other nipple and reaching the other part of the machine. He gets lifted out of his chair and hovers in the air. Mr. Ripley tries to unplug the machine but fails, so he smashes it with a chair. Jeremy falls to the ground, and the other students quickly leave the classroom. Mr. Ripley approaches Jeremy, who is unconscious, and touches him on the shoulder. This causes all the hairs on Mr. Ripley's forearm to stand up, and Jeremy enters a kind of unconscious state. At the hospital, Dr. Wayne doesn't believe Mr. Ripley's explanation of what happened because an electrical shock would typically harm or burn someone. Surprisingly, Jeremy seems to be perfectly fine. Mr. Ripley starts to think that Jeremy's body is constantly going through a process called electrolysis, which could be the reason why he doesn't grow hair. The nurse interrupts their conversation to inform them that Jeremy has run away from the hospital. While Jeremy is on the way back to his grandfather's house, he meets Lindsay, a girl from his class who witnessed the event. While they are talking, some of the neighbors stare at Jeremy. Jeremy notices this and tells Lindsay that he can hear people's thoughts and memories, even things they aren't aware of themselves. However, Lindsay thinks that he might be hallucinating as a result of being electrocuted. After she gives him directions to the interstate bridge, Jeremy continues his journey. On the bridge, Sheriff Barnum and Officer Duncan intercept Jeremy and make him turn back. Back at school, Jeremy is called into the conference room to discuss the results of his IQ test. Dr. Stippler, the chairman, tells Jeremy that his IQ score is incredibly high, surpassing any known classification. He explains that Jeremy's intelligence is off the charts. Jeremy simply expresses his desire to return to his grandfather's home, but Jesse delivers the unfortunate news that the bank now owns the house. The following day, Barnum and Officer Duncan take the kids from the youth shelter on a camping trip in the woods. While Jeremy sits alone, Away from the rest of the group, Sheriff Barnum joins him. A thunderstorm starts, and Jeremy becomes worried. He tells Barnum that when he hears thunder, he can feel it inside himself, and when lightning strikes, he feels a connection to it. The next morning, Jeremy goes deeper into the woods. He places his hands on the ground, and geckos gather around him. He picks one up while the others scatter in fear. Jeremy calls out to John and Mitch, who had been hiding behind a nearby tree, watching him. Jeremy notices that John is holding a gun. John raises the gun and takes aim, threatening Jeremy and calling him a freak. Suddenly, a gunshot is heard in the distance. All three of them run towards the sound. Jeremy discovers a group of boys surrounding a dying deer that had been shot in the heart. Officer Duncan rushes towards the deer with a gun in hand and brags about his hunting skills, taking pride in his kill. As tears fill Jeremy's eyes, he feels the intense pain and fear the dying deer is experiencing. He kneels down and places one hand on the deer's neck, while using his other hand to grab onto Duncan's wrist. Jeremy then transfers the pain and fear from the deer to Duncan, causing Duncan to feel increasing agony as the deer convulses. John threatens to shoot Jeremy if he doesn't let go, but Jeremy bravely stares down the barrel of the gun. Just as John pulls the trigger, Mitch steps in and saves Jeremy's life by lifting the gun. Duncan becomes so frightened that the rest of the group has to hold him down to prevent him from running into the woods. Jesse approaches Jeremy and asks what happened in the woods. Jeremy simply expresses his desire to go back home. Jesse claims to be his friend who wants to help him. This angers Jeremy, and he erupts in rage, telling her that friends don't take you away from home and lock you up. As Jeremy moves forward, the lights hanging on the wall and the glass panel on the door shatter into many pieces. He storms out of the room. That night, when Barnum returns home, Dr. Wayne informs him that his wife's condition has worsened significantly, and she is experiencing the most intense pain of her life. 
Barnum expresses his confusion as to why his wife continues to hold on, believing that there must be a reason why she refuses to pass away. During lunchtime in the youth center, Mr. Ripley approaches Jeremy to have a conversation. He reveals that when he touched Jeremy while he was unconscious on the classroom floor, he felt an intense surge of energy unlike anything he has ever experienced before. This energy felt like a strong drug that made Mr. Ripley feel young and full of energy again, as if he were twenty years old. He shares with Jeremy that Albert Einstein once said that if humans could unlock 100% of their brain's potential, they would become pure energy. Mr. Ripley believes that something might have happened to Jeremy long ago, unlocking the full capacity of his brain, and as a result, he tells Jeremy that he thinks Jeremy's mind represents the future evolution of the human race, and he wants to be Jeremy's friend so that he can learn as much as possible from him. The next morning, Barnum visits Duncan to check on him. He notices that Duncan has gotten rid of all his guns, which is strange because hunting is something Duncan loves. Barnum is concerned that Duncan's refusal to carry a gun as a police officer could make him a liability. Outside, Duncan tells Barnum about what happened when he shot the deer. He explains how Jeremy transferred the deer's pain to him, and in that moment, Duncan not only felt the deer's death, but he also felt as if he had become the deer, experiencing all its pain, emotions, and sensations. Upon hearing this, Barnum gets an idea. That night, he asks Jeremy if he would accompany him to his house and brings him upstairs to see his wife. Barnum asks Jeremy if he can communicate with his wife and discover what he needs to do in order for her to find peace and move on. Jeremy gently touches her forehead and starts hearing her thoughts within his mind. She expresses that she cannot leave yet, not until Barnum forgives and accepts Stephen. Barnum remains stubborn and unwilling to forgive his son, but she reminds him of a memory from their past. She reminds him of a time when Stephen was a child and the three of them played together in the snow. She specifically mentions that she lost her wedding ring during their playful time together. On that day, Barnum and Stephen spent hours searching for the lost ring. Barnum remembers how dedicated Stephen was, coming home from school every day to dig through the snow in hopes of finding it. As tears stream down her face, Jeremy tells Barnum that his wife wants him to open the silver box that Stephen had brought recently. Barnum opens the box and discovers the ring inside causing him to cry. Jeremy explains that Stephen had found the ring while working on the garden at their old house. After Barnum places the ring on his wife's finger, Jeremy touches Barnum's wrist with his other hand. Suddenly, Barnum starts hearing his wife's voice in his mind. He reassures her that everything will be all right, and as he embraces her, she opens her eyes one last time before peacefully passing away. Stephen hurries to the house and as soon as he arrives, Barnum warmly embraces him while they both shed tears. A few days later, Jeremy goes on a date with Lindsay at the county fair. Jeremy asks Lindsay if she thinks he is ugly, just like his father believed. Lindsay responds by saying that he has the most beautiful face she has ever seen and she kisses him. Lindsay's father witnesses the kiss and confronts Jeremy. He attacks Jeremy using hurtful words and treating him as less than human. Jesse swiftly steps in and calls out Lindsay's father, whose name happens to be Dick. Dick insults Jeremy one final time before leaving with Lindsay. Feeling heartbroken, Jeremy packs his belongings and decides to return to the one place where he felt accepted his granddad's home. As he leaves the youth shelter, he hears some noise coming from the gym and curiously enters, only to find the other teens playing basketball. John confronts Jeremy and takes his hat. When Jeremy tries to retrieve it, John challenges him to a fight, daring him to take his best shot if he thinks he's strong enough to get the hat back. Suddenly, Jeremy gains insight into John's memories and starts recounting the day when John's stepdad took his hat away when he was a young boy. That hat was the only memento left by his deceased father. Hearing this revelation, John becomes emotional and threatens to harm Jeremy. A thunderstorm begins, and John forcefully drags Jeremy out into the rain. Accompanied by his friends, John strips Jeremy naked and mocks his pale complexion, stating that he needs some color. Finally, he tosses Jeremy into a muddy puddle. When they pull Jeremy back up, John cruelly tells him that he will never be accepted by them. 
This statement fills Jeremy with profound sadness and anger, causing him to unleash a sudden burst of energy. The force of this energy knocks everyone, including Jeremy himself. Concerned for John's well-being, Mitch rushes over to check on him and realizes that John's heart has stopped beating. Acting quickly, Jeremy administers a few electric shocks to John's chest, successfully reviving him. Realizing the danger they are in, Mitch offers to assist Jeremy in escaping and returning to his granddad's home. He sneaks Jeremy onto a van that is heading towards the farm where Jeremy's granddad lives. When Jeremy arrives at his granddad's house, he discovers that everything— including his bed and all his books in the basement, has been removed or taken away. Jesse rushes to the house and comforts Jeremy, promising him that she will find a new place where he can feel at home. Mr. Ripley joins them as they prepare to leave, but their plans are interrupted by the arrival of Barnum and Duncan, who have come to take Jeremy back into custody. Jesse pleads with Barnum to release Jeremy, and surprisingly, Barnum agrees. Jeremy then shares with Barnum that when his wife passed away, he didn't feel like she simply disappeared, but rather that she went somewhere else. This revelation brings a smile to Barnum's face. Jeremy suddenly dashes into the field, and everyone follows in pursuit. In a remarkable moment, the clouds above part, and a lightning bolt strikes Jeremy directly in the chest. He feels a surge of energy coursing through him, and it continues to intensify until he releases a powerful burst of vibrant energy that spreads throughout the entire field. As this happens, Jeremy mysteriously disappears. As they all remain fixated on the clouds, the sky rumbles one last time with a resounding thunder.